That's better. It's the candy. You're coming down. You're having that sugar crash. Except for Esther, who's now just, just now waking up. <laughs> so in your bulletin, there is a set of bulletin notes. There's some questions that Rob sent out beforehand. I know what you're like. You didn't look at them. You didn't think about them. You didn't reflect on the passage before you got here. Maybe one in every 19 people here did. I won't say nobody did it, but I know what you're like, because I'm just like you. <laughs> if I wasn't speaking today, I probably wouldn't be as prepared either. My wife, the high school teacher, who's all about people doing their homework, probably did it. <laughs> and if she didn't, she wouldn't admit it. Feeling feisty this morning. <laughs> see, she, see, she could have, she could have hooked off this morning. See, she's part of this, uh, what is it called, Nova Scotia Marine Mammal Association, or what's it? Anyway, they had every once in a blue moon, some piece of um, dead marine life floats up on the shore, and then they have to do autopsies and stuff, and so they call her because she likes that sort of thing. And so this morning, she could have hooked off, unbeknownst to me, because they had a dolphin that they wanted to do an autopsy slash necropsy on. And she decided to come and hear her husband speak instead of going elbow deep into dolphin guts. She loves me. She really loves me. You don't understand how excited she gets about doing this sort of stuff on the beach. No, don't you don't. And I don't either. And best of all, it's something I've never personally seen with my own two eyes. But I hear lots of stories. So, what, do I, what am I talking about? Oh, yes. See, I'm a little bit all over the place because I tweaked my back this morning and then I took some back medication. And it seems to... <laughs> so I cannot be responsible for what might come out of me at this point. So, let's think about where we're at, where we're really at. Because you know what? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. And I've heard it, I've heard it from some of you, I've heard it in meetings we've had recently. There are people here at LifeBridge who are hurting. There are people here at LifeBridge who are broken, that are struggling, that are really in need of healing on the inside, who need friends to come alongside of them, who need to hear something from God to have a realization that he really does care. Have you been in that place like I was six years ago? Six years ago, there were numerous times I would pray, God, can't you hear me? Don't you see me? Don't you love me? What do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? Some of it is we, we get into that zone, but sometimes it's more of how much longer must this go on? How much longer do I have to struggle with this junk? Have you been there? Sure you have. All of us at some point have been in a place where we're battling within ourselves and we don't want anybody to see it or we won't let anybody see it and we, and we journey that journey alone but we're crying out in this state of brokenness. Did you know that Romans chapter 8 is one of the most triumphant chapters in all of the Bible? But it starts out with the whole the, the context of it is, is that you've heard the verse, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. And the chapter itself ends with nothing can separate us from the love of God. But squashed in the middle there, in verse 23, is the fact that even though we are connected with God, our spirit is groaning inwardly while we await being released from our suffering. While we're here on earth, there's going to be days, there's going to be weeks, there's going to be months and months and seasons and maybe years where we will be facing struggles. Where we're in that empty, barren, sort of desert-like place on the inside and we just want our situation to change and we can't change it. We try hard, but we can't change it. Why does God let us go through that stuff? Why must we go through those sorts of things? The good news is, there's an end to it. 
The end might be today, the end might be next week, the end might be next year, but somewhere along the way we come out of it. Just like six years ago this week, I went into the pit in this sort of dark, dark place, and I was there for well over three months after I realized I was in the pit, but I was hurtling downwards down the side of this very rough and rocky mountain for months, maybe even years, before I got to the realization of how bad it was. You see, I got to the place where I had been in denial for so long that my body just started to react. There were things, spiritual, physical manifestations in myself that I could no longer control. I consider myself a little bit of an emotional person, but you don't see it a lot. But I'd be sitting there at my desk, and all of a sudden I'd start to cry. Not like the sobbing, emotional, weepy kind of things. Just sitting there, and all of a sudden water's pouring out of my eyes, and I'm like, what is going on? And I'd try to pull it together, and I'd get up away from my desk, and I'd go have a glass of water, and I'd go for a walk. And I'd, oh, okay, I got, I got this. I got this. I can fix this. And I'd go back to work, and I'd be okay for a while, and then it would start again. And it was really freaking me out because I couldn't control it. So, of course, when I went to the doctor, finally, after much stubbornness, much prodding from somebody who, sitting up here in the second row, who kept saying, you should go see your doctor. And I'm like, ah, I don't need to go see my doctor. I'm fine. You should go see your doctor. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. I'm fine. Are you fine? When I finally realized, OK, I'm out of control. I can't control this. I can't control how I feel. I can't control my circumstances. I can't control anything. I've got to do something. So I go to the doctor and he says, you know what? Your body is literally crying out for rest. And you need to go on rest leave. And I was like, no, no not, not right now. I got too much to do. And guess what? He made me. He even made me call him the day after he wrote me this neat little note that says, you're off on, st on stress or medical leave for the next 30 days. And he said, you send that in to your employer. And then as soon as you've done that, you call my office to confirm that you've done it. He didn't believe I'd do it. That's how stubborn I was. But you know what? I needed it, and I needed it badly. But I still showed up here the following Sunday, and you didn't know. And the week after that, and the week after that, and guess what? In the first two to three weeks that I was supposedly on rest leave, and I, things were supposedly going to be all bad, like, I had no work, I had no responsibilities, I had nothing to do but sleep. Guess what? I couldn't sleep. And it got worse. It actually got worse. I felt worse. I couldn't sleep. I slept less. I was even more stressed out because of what people might think, my colleagues, my friends, my family, and you. I was worried about you, what you thought. And some of you knew that I'd taken some time off work, but you didn't know. You didn't know what I was really going through. And it's not that you didn't care, but because I wouldn't tell you, because I wouldn't share it, many of you didn't know. So you couldn't help me. Have you been there? Are you there? Well, this psalm is a good place for us to kind of connect with a guy like King David who had it all but still was in... He, he's a guy who was all over the map with his emotional journey as well. So just because you have your extreme highs and your extreme lows doesn't mean that you're any different than him. Doesn't mean you're any different from me. Doesn't mean you're any different from this person sitting next to you. Verse 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This is pure candor. So a, a, a psalm is poetry, but a psalm is also prayer. During the time that I was going through what I went through six years ago, 
the song, I could not read anything. I thought, hey, this is great. I've got all kinds of books I want, I've been wanting to read. I'll read for the next four, well, I didn't know I was going to be off for four months. I'll read for the next month. I couldn't read. I couldn't keep it inside. I thought, okay, well, I'll at least read the Bible. I'll read one Bible chapter a day. I couldn't do it. My brain couldn't process it. But one verse, one verse at a time, or two verses, two verses at a time, the Psalms became my place of healing because I could relate because the psalms in their poetry are songs of, of, of groaning like this, of, of crying out to God, but they're also song, songs of praise. And so I began reading a couple psalm verses a day, but I not only read them, I started to pray them. You didn't, I might have even sang one or two, but I won't do that for you this morning because that would be like kind of screechy like last night and you know, it would feel like Halloween. <laughs> but I prayed these verses. The Psalms are there because they're great places for you to pray when you're in that low, low place. How long, Lord? Be honest with God. Lay out what you need before him. How long? It's okay to be honest with God. David was brutally honest, complete candor. He had complete freedom of speech, and so do you. You know what? It's okay. God's okay with it. Now, you, you have to have a little bit of reverence and respect in the process because God did create you, and he is ultimately in control whether you feel like he is or not. But the reality is he welcomes you to be completely brutally honest with where you're at and what you need. Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Because David was struggling with God in a big way because he felt like God had forgotten him, that God had abandoned him. And you know what? If you feel that way, it's okay for you to let him know what you think. Verse 2, how mu long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Do you ever feel like you're losing the battle? Like you're defeated by life or the circumstances that you're in, by your job, by your family, by your neighbors, by your friends? Are you defeated in some way where you just feel like you're alone and you're losing and losing and losing? You have to pay attention here. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Where do we go when we get into that place where we're in the pit, when we are broken, when we're battling with our, within ourselves. We start churning it around in our mind, and our thoughts take over, and our feelings take over. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like they care. I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I have a purpose. And the more you think it, and the more you become insular like that, and you lock yourself away among, uh, just with yourself, you, you're, you become like David. His thoughts were this never-ending merry-go-round where he was just wrestling within himself, and he'd basically be, become locked into just himself. So what do you get locked into? You're not in a praiseful state at this point. You're not in a good place at this point. So what are you doing? You're actually digging yourself deeper. Because you're all alone. You've been there. I've been there. One of the reasons I wouldn't share how I felt when I was going through what I was doing, going through six years ago is because I didn't feel like sharing. Back to the pride thing. I want people to think I've got it all under control. I want my colleagues to think I have it under control. I want my wife to think I have it under control. I want anybody else that sees me, I want you to see me how I want you to see me, not how I really am. And you're doing it too. We all do it because we all dig ourselves deep into this hole inside ourselves. When you go it alone, you just go in circles. You don't move forward. Things never get resolved all on your own. This is a life of faith, and at some point, you need to pray like this. 
At some point, you need somebody to come alongside you and pray with you and journey with you. See, somehow we've been taught that, well, if you're a Christian, then life is great. Everything's going to be perfect after you have a relationship with God. Well, guess what? My experience has been that many times when you commit your life to walking with God, it gets harder. Now, some of that is because we are now living with a slightly different standard. But some of it also is, is that we're in, there is such a thing as spiritual warfare. Now, this particular sermon or message is not really about spiritual warfare. But make no mistake, there is a battle going on that is happening that's spiritual, and it's happening to all of us. And we're all influenced by it, especially the more we want to serve God, the more we want to be close to God, the more we want to make a difference as, as a community or as, as a team of people, or the more we want to make a difference for the kingdom, the battle is stronger and stronger and stronger against us. The other thing you need to do is lay out exactly how you feel. Look, at, look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Lay out how you feel. Lay out what you feel. Ask God for help. He's saying here in this, in this verse, give light to my eyes. Show me something. Show me something. What am I supposed to do? Where on earth am I going? Why is this happening? Show me something. We all get to places where we're like, God, what are you doing? Like as if we think he doesn't know. It may not look that way to, from where we're sitting right now, but he is in control, even, even though you might not feel it. It's okay to cry out, God, show me something. Give light to my eyes so that I don't feel like I'm lying here in the darkness or in death. Please don't let me lose the battle, God. Please. And whether the battle is something real, like so some people would say, well, David's battle was a military battle. Well, maybe it was. Maybe his enemies were real enemies. But sometimes it's more metaphorical. Maybe it's more situational, something going on. Maybe your battle is with your boss or with a colleague or with a neighbor or with a friend or a broken relationship or something with your spouse or your family. Maybe the brokenness is that battle. It's not insignificant. God cares about that too. It's okay to ask for God to give you wisdom and direction so that you know where you're headed, even though you can't see in the darkness of where you are about where you're actually going. So practically, how does this really play out for you, for where you are today, or for where you, maybe you're in a really good place today, and, but you know somebody, maybe in your small group, maybe it's somebody you are related to, maybe it's somebody at work, where you can see that they are going through this deep, dark place. If you're there yourself or you know somebody that is, what do you do? Because their cry, or your cry right now, is probably, God's hiding his face from me. God's hiding from me. I don't see him, I don't feel him, I don't know he's there and I just keep praying and praying and praying, and there is absolutely no response. Do you know that I thought I was smart? So I thought, OK, I can't see it. I can't feel it. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to get away for a couple of days. And I'm going to go somewhere, and I'm going to be quiet and let God speak to me. I actually had to do it twice. The first time, I actually did cry out, God, where are you? Don't you care? Can't you see how I feel? Don't you know what I'm going through? How long does this have to go on for? And you know what? I heard nothing. And it made me angry. It's like, I just took two days and went away, and my whole purpose was to let you speak into my life, and I opened up the Bible and I heard nothing. I prayed and I heard nothing. I got no insight. I got no wisdom. I got nothing. I just keep praying and praying, and there's nothing. Is it okay to be that way? Yeah, it was. Because if I hadn't gone through that, I couldn't share it with you now. But it was part of a process that God was taking me through, trying to get me to slow down, 
trying to get me to rely on him and not on myself, trying to let him be in control and not me. Guess what happened when I did it the second time? I didn't go in with such an attitude like, okay, I'm taking, my, I'm taking two days off just for you, God, so like, this is your chance. Go ahead. That was my attitude the first time. Second time was like, you know what? Whatever you want to tell me. And guess what? It told me a lot. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about God. I could read certain passages in the Bible, and they popped alive. And I came out of that, and I was rejuvenated. The time lag between the two was probably two months. But God was taking me on a journey. And it hurt a lot. So when you are in that place, you have to be someone who reaches out first to God. But you know what else started happening after that first little retreat I did where I heard nothing? I started to be a little less prideful and I started to share a little bit with people who would listen. Now, I chose a few people very strategically because there's some that I just felt a greater sense of comfort with or a certain level of um, trust in, but I started to share what I was really feeling. Of course, who says that? What are you, how are you really doing? That guy, that guy made me so mad, yes, Gordon McKenzie made me so mad because in the early part of me starting to let it go, he'd walk up one day in the parking lot here. Everybody's le left. He walks up and he goes, I'm sitting there in my car, and he walks up to the car and he looks in the window and he goes, so how are you really doing? And I lost it. I couldn't even say how I was really doing because he could see how I was really doing. And it made me mad because I don't like to cry in public and look at me. But it's OK. It's OK to have that emotion, because God created you with feelings. Your feelings may be up and down and all over the place, but he created you that way. There's no need to deny them. There's no need to ignore them or reject them. It's OK to feel. God created you that way. But you were not meant to journey alone. You were meant to journey with him, and you were meant to journey with other people. That's why we have this thing called the church. It's a community of people who journey together. Don't let your pride keep you alone. Did you hear that? Don't let your pride keep you alone. If you're alone, in most cases, it's because you choose to be alone. I chose to be alone. Some of you are choosing to be alone. Please stop. God doesn't want you to be alone. The people in this room do not want you to be alone. God loves you. We love you. You're not alone. But you have to choose. So what, after all this letting God know how you feel and letting God know what you need and trying to break out of your own in, internal mess, what do you do? What can you learn about the character and nature of God or Jesus in this passage? Well, you can learn to lean into what you know. Lean into what you know. Verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Your ability, God's ability to rescue me is there. I have to trust in his ability to rescue me. I, I, you might be in this place and say, I can't feel your love, but God, I'm going to trust it anyway. I can't feel the love of people around me, but I'm going to trust it's there somewhere anyway. The issues in this psalm really are that David's been in pain a long time, and he's questioning how long must I go on with this. But the conclusion is, and this is the important thing for where you're at right now, the conclusion is, God's love will outlast my pain. God's love will outlast my difficulty. God's love will outlast my situation. There is no situation too big for him. And that may sound like a cliche, but it is true. <coughs> I'm going to believe, I'm going to dare to believe, that God's love will last longer than my current situation. 
I dare you to, to, try to say that. God's love will last longer than my current situations. This is where we start to turn from our feelings towards faith. And it's hard because we're so wired to be stuck over here. To turn our mind to what we know about who the character of God is, about his loving, caring nature that he created us, that he knows us better than anybody, that he knows us better than we know ourselves, and that he cares about us more than anybody ever will. We need to lean into that faith. Because God, in verse 6, I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Guess what? Here's where it ties into Honduras. You're not living on the street. You have food. You have friends. You have health. Maybe it's not the health you want, but you have enough health that you are here today. If we start taking our mind out of where we're at and this churning about, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Not bad to have feelings, but at a certain point, we have to say, it's not about me. And look at what God has done for me. Look at who he is. Look at what he's provided me. I'm really not alone. I've got so much. You have so much. But we always kind of zoom into the glass half empty sort of scenario, don't we? Oh, yeah, but it's not the way I want it to be. Oh, my, my job's not what I want it to be, but, well, do you have one? My relationships aren't what I want them to be. But do you have some? My health isn't what I want it to be, but you're not dead yet. Let's take a second and just think about the power of praise and thanksgiving. I want you to watch this little video. <laughs> 